this story takes place when I was 14 and female. Now I'm 23. It was late summer and I was coming home from hanging out at the beach for my best friend Mia's 17th birthday party. When I got off the subway at my stop, I looked at the bus arrival screen. Now the bus I would normally take home was arriving in an hour or so. Being a tired 14 year old girl, I decided it might be a better idea to take an alternate bus route home. This was a decision I would come to later regret. When I got off the bus at the stop, I had about a 10 minute walk to my building. My area at night was pretty quiet, not many cars around on the streets or anything. But as I'm walking up the street, I hear the sound of an engine nearby. I look over my left shoulder and see a white panel van, I know how typical, rolling slowly up the street. I tried to think nothing of it, but when I turned on to my street, the van followed right behind me. I began to become unsettled and started walking faster. The van was driving slowly behind me and never once passed me by. When I turned up the long driveway to my building, the van once again turned too. Now I was really scared. The driveway to my building has an ice rink on the side of it with bright lights, so I walked beside the rink under those bright lights. There are small town houses on the other side of the driveway. The van caught up to me and stopped. I thought maybe this person might be lost or something, or trying to ask for directions. I was trying to find any way to rationalize this somehow. I stopped and stayed about four feet away from the van just in case. I looked into the van window to see an older man starting to bald with black hair and a white t-shirt. I asked them if they were lost but they didn't respond. Instead, they tried to convince me to get into their van. I said no, obviously, and started walking away, but the van started to drive slowly, following along behind me once again. When a red car began to drive down the driveway, the van drove all the way to the end of it and waited for the red car to turn out before reversing to be beside me again. At this point, the man was still trying to get me to get into the van. I wanted to make a mad dash to my building, but I was worried he would see where I lived, so I kept on walking. When another car came down the driveway, the van did exactly what it did before again, drove to the end and waited for the car to leave. This time though, there was a cab dropping someone off at the town houses. The cabbie was closing his trunk, when out of the corner of his eye he saw me. Hey, are you okay? He called out to me. I told him how the van had been following me, and how every time a car came by, the van drove to the end and waited for it to leave before following me again. The cabbie told me he would get in his car, drive to the end of the driveway, and sit there for a bit so I had enough time to run to my building. I told him okay and thanked him. The van was back in line with me once again. The cabbie follows his word and gets into his cab, and drives all the way up the driveway. The van follows close behind. I look to see the two vehicles sitting there, and I run up the rest of the driveway into my building's lobby. My heart was racing. When I get to my apartment, I was still freaked out. I went into my room and called the cops right away. While I was on the phone with them, I looked out my bedroom window to see if I could see the van. I saw it slowly driving around my building in circles, apparently searching for me. Now I was fully panicking. The cops sent officers to sweep the area eventually, but they didn't end up finding him. Two officers came to my apartment to get a statement from me. About a week after this happened, the officers came back once again. They showed me a photo of the man from the van that they were able to get from the security camera on the side of the building. I told them that that was indeed the man in the photo that had followed me. They told me they'd found him and that he was being put on the sex offender list. So I guess all's well that ends well in the end. So I live in a not so great area in Cleveland, Ohio. This story happened to me about three weeks ago now, when I was homebound from work because I was quite sick. I was sitting in my kitchen eating some cereal when I noticed a black van parked on the opposite street of my house. There were three people sitting inside, but I just assumed it had something to do with one of my neighbors. 
I keep my house dead bolted shut anyways, and I have both a gun and an alarm system, so I wasn't too worried about it. I was watching YouTube on my phone, when it rang suddenly with an unknown number. I picked it up, asking who it was, and was met with the voice of a woman. Is this my name? I said yes, and she kept talking, telling me that my girlfriend's name had been in a bad car crash and was severely injured. She told me I needed to come as quickly as possible, as I may not have a lot of time left before she died. Well, understandably, after hearing that, I sort of became manic. I grabbed my car keys and wallet and ran to my car to start driving to the hospital. I got about halfway down the street, when I realized that they hadn't even said what hospital it was. I tried to call the number again, but this time they didn't pick up. I copied and pasted that number into the Google search too, and no hospital came up either, just a bunch of random shit and websites. I tried calling my girlfriend next. She picked up immediately. It was embarrassing, but I was crying, asking her what happened and if she was really going to be okay. She told me she was fine, and when I mentioned the hospital, she was quite confused and had no idea what I was talking about. I was really confused and couldn't really process what was happening, but I turned around midway and decided to go home. Well, just as I was getting into view of my house, I saw that same black van parked backwards into my driveway. It wasn't quite fully clicking right away in my dumbass brain what was happening, but I knew well enough that they had no reason to be there in my driveway. When I drove past, there was only one dude in the car now. The other two were literally right at my front door, which I had forgotten to lock in my panic when I ran out to my car. They were all wearing beanies and face masks, so it was hard to actually see what they looked like beside their eyes. When they saw me pull next to their van, the two started running back over to my car, and we all started having an intense shouting match. It was basically me screaming, what the fuck are you doing parked in my driveway, and them yelling for me to shut the fuck up. We kept doing that back and forth when one of them flashed a pistol at me and threatened to shoot me. As soon as I saw the gun, I floored my gas pedal and fumbled to dial 911 as I drove. I could see them pulling out in my rear view, driving in the opposite direction out of the neighborhood. The police came soon after, and I gave them a description of the van and the clothes they were wearing. I also managed to memorize about half of their license plate, but I doubt those were real plates anyways. I had so much adrenaline pumping through my body that I was actually physically shaking. I filed a report with them, but I haven't heard back since. That just kind of seems to be the way it is around here, sadly. Either way, I was really startled because not only did they know where I lived, but obviously they were the caller as well, and somehow knew my name, my girlfriend's name, and that I was going to be home from work. That sure as shit scared the hell out of me, and now I've bought a ring doorbell system. I also triple check my doors are locked every time I leave the house now. I pray to God some shit like that never happens to me again, because it was so horrifying. And to those people who tried robbing my house and even threatened to kill me, I hope we never fucking meet again. Okay, so I will preface this by saying that these events happened exactly 20 years ago, pretty much to the day. I'll also mention that this could come across as slightly anticlimactic as it doesn't end with a dead body or imprisonment or something like that. It is, however, true and accurate as I can remember it at least. Sorry if this comes across as rambling at times as well. So, to start off, it was not long before my ninth birthday. I was a shy, very introverted kid who only had very few friends. Therefore, I was really eager to impress the friends I did have. I mean, a few friends are better than none, right? This story involves my closest friend at the time, whose name was Damon. Being so shy, I would never really turn up to any parties or social events. I just couldn't really face it. But it did worry me that this would eventually cause me to lose the few friendships I did have. You can imagine my horror when my dad picked me up from the school gates and Damon's mother picked him up at the same time, and then asked me right on the spot, Hey, Damon and his brother are going to, insert name of Caravan Park, this weekend. Would you like to come too? 
For those unfamiliar, a caravan holiday in the UK is just a cheap couple of days in a huge field full of trailers with the tacky nearby entertainment and amusements. On the spot and terrified of being seen as rude, I accepted right away. Come Friday evening, I was sat in the car in the back between Damon and his little brother Lucas, who was two years younger than us. It was only really a short car ride there, but it all felt so uncomfortable and alien to me, floating through dark back streets I had never seen before, as the wind and rain lashed at the windshield wipers while they tried their best to keep up. When we arrived, it was already quite late. We watched some crap on TV and went right to bed. I had one of those old brick Nokia phones that you could play Snake on that I promised I would text my dad on to let him know I was okay which I did as soon as I got there. The strong gale swayed the caravan that night as I fell into an uneasy sleep. The next day, we hit the shops to spend our pocket money. Then, in the afternoon, we went to the entertainment with Damon and Lucas's parents. It was just a bunch of awful live acting with clowns and such nonsense. I may have been eight, but I wasn't a baby. Later on, though, when around 8 p.m., the adult entertainment settled in. Some comedian of some repute. Me, Damon, and Lucas were absolutely bored stiff by the act. Damon and I wanted to just head back to the caravan, watch some South Park, and look at the cool new stuff we'd bought earlier. I saw Damon ask his parents for permission, who were happily drinking away and chatting to other parents, and as a child, it seemed swapping life stories. Eventually, they gave Damon the keys to the caravan, which was about a five-minute walk away, but instructed us to take Lucas along with. We snatched up the keys and headed out. We walked for about two minutes in the cold and dark, mindlessly chatting about our eyeball rings we bought earlier at the gift shop and saying how they automatically give you a super hard punch or something. Just stupid eight-year-old chat stuff. We noticed, though, that in between two of the caravans, there was a white van, I know, how typical, with its back doors wide open. We thought nothing of it though, maybe someone had just arrived and were unloading their stuff. That was completely wrong though. As we walked by the van, a man suddenly emerged from the pitch blackness and began to approach us very slowly. It was quite an abnormal walk as well. I remember it being almost like how you would skulk in the dark being careful not to stand on anything. Strangely though, we didn't actually get too worried until the man began to speak. He stared at us for a few moments, but didn't smile or otherwise physically acknowledge us at all. All of a sudden though, while staring past us, he blurted out an enthusiastic, Alright boys, can one of you strong lads help me shift this heavy box into the back of my van? I've hurt my back quite badly, you see. Back then, stranger danger wasn't as commonly spoken about as it is today, but I absolutely knew something about this was not right. His walk, his voice, his eyes. I had a million thoughts running through about ten seconds. What could I do in this situation? Call my dad? He's miles away. Scream for help? There's no one in these caravans. They're all by the entertainment. Fight him? <laughs> yeah, right. I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. As Damon and I stood frozen, his younger brother naively piped up. Yeah, okay, I'm strong. He started marching toward this guy who was only about 15 feet away from us. I'll never forget that horrid look on his face when he saw Lucas walking toward him, like a spider that had just caught a fly. I heard Damon let out a broken screech. Lucas, no! It's at this point I'm ashamed to say I continued walking the way we were originally meant to go, and quite fast. I couldn't watch this. What was I going to do if he murdered Lucas right in front of me? What if he came and grabbed me next? The only thing I could think to do was walk away quickly and try to find someone, anyone who could help us. About ten seconds later, Damon and Lucas came sprinting up from behind me, shouting run, and run we did. Oh, how we ran. I don't know how Damon got Lucas away. I don't know even if the man chased us. I don't know what he wanted with us. But I do have a few ideas. As we approached the caravan, I began to feel semi-rational again. As we began to catch our breath, I remember saying something to Damon along the lines of, 
Why couldn't we just run back to the entertainment area to get our parents? Damon replied with something like, What, run towards him? Are you stupid? It was a good point, but I was too busy trying not to cry to say anything else. As Damon fumbled around with his keys at the caravan door, for some reason or another, the keys just did not work as we tried all of them. We tried turning them in all directions, pushing and pulling while hoping and praying. I can clearly picture in my mind being stood there in that dark night with Damon and Lucas, in fear, the key halfway hanging out of the lock, the confusion. But most of all, I remember Damon looking straight at me after turning bright red with puffy eyes and bursting into tears because he realized what I would then realize seconds later. We had to go back. Strangely, Lucas was the only one not crying. I think he was too young to understand the danger we were all in. After deciding that we were just in as much danger standing there as we would be going back, we headed back towards Damon's parents. I've never run that fast in the 20 years since then, and I dare say Damon would say the same. About halfway there, we heard the most disgusting, primal wail you can imagine. It was about five seconds long, and it sounded like a mixture of anger and pain. We never stopped, though. Just made brief eye contact and kept going. Had the man just killed someone? Or was the man screaming because he knew we had gotten away? We would never know. We burst through the entertainment area doors and sprinted toward Damon's parents, who were blissfully unaware of the horrors that had just occurred. I remember his mother staring at us wide-eyed with her mouth open as we all burst into floods of tears. Half because of the trauma and half because of the relief, I felt so warm and safe there. We tried to explain in young babble and gibberish, but I'm not sure we got our point across. The next morning, I asked to just go straight home. I don't truly understand what happened that night. I don't know who he was, what he wanted, why he screamed, or why he was even there. But like I said, I do have my theories. Thankfully, no one was killed that night in the caravan park, because nobody else was around to scream. This is going to be a long one, since I've never managed to really put the whole story together clearly until now. This happened in a relatively small town slash city in Canada in April of 2016, just before I graduated high school. I was around 17 at the time. It was my grad year, and most of the people in my grad class were partying, planning activities to celebrate our upcoming graduation. One of the traditions in my town is to play a grad game called Rambo, which is basically a version of Predator Prey. A bunch of people would meet up at a specific location on one side of the city, and the goal was for the runners to make it to a spot on the other side of the city without getting caught by the Seekers, which were groups of three to four in their cars. Runners also went in groups of three to four, but they had to be on foot. My grad class was around 200 people, and I would say this particular night there were about 60 to 70 people playing. This takes place after it's completely dark outside. I think it was about 11 p.m. at night. I had planned to be a runner in a group of four with my boyfriend at the time, as well as my friend and her boyfriend. However, my now ex bailed at the last minute to go do drugs at a different party with his friends, which left me as a weird third wheel with my friend and her man. No problem, right? I never should have gone. Now, for reference, I'm pretty tiny. Like, I'm 4 foot 11 and weighed around 80 pounds at the time. I genuinely look like I'm around 13 if I don't wear makeup, and you don't get a good look at me. Anyway, my friend and I got all dressed up in black and put war paint on our cheeks. The three of us headed to the spot. I live in what I've always considered to be a very safe town, mostly full of families and retired people. There are only a few bad-ish neighborhoods in the city. The game started and we all ran. It was all fun and games until about an hour in and around midnight. We had to cross through one of said neighborhoods. While we were walking along a residential street sidewalk, one of the seeker cars came ripping down the street and the three of us ran. Of course, my friend and her man stayed together, and I got separated somehow in the scuffle. Once the Seekers weren't in the immediate area, I started calling out to my friends. I could hear their voices somewhere far off in the distance. I texted my friend, 
She said they were in an alley on the other side of the houses, while I was still on the sidewalk out front. I had two options. I could walk to the end of the block and find the alley that way, but I was about 20 houses away in either direction, and I knew for a fact that there were seekers nearby who had seen us and knew we were in the area. My other option was to cut through someone's yard and immediately be in the alley and reunite with my group. I chose the latter. Why I did this, I'll never know. Like I said, I am a tiny little girl, and this was known to be a fairly rough neighborhood. I looked at the nearest houses and spotted one that didn't have a front gate. His lawn went straight into the backyard, save for a few shrubs on the side of the house. I thought this might mean I could just go straight through, and there wouldn't be a back fence either. I chose this house, and stepped over the shrubs and jogged towards the back. As I did, a motion light came on that illuminated the backyard. This scared me, but I was already in, so I figured I should just get out as fast as possible. When the light came on, however, I noticed that there was, in fact, a fence, and about a six to seven foot tall one at that. I certainly couldn't jump it, but there was a gate with a latch that I ran to. I remember having to stand on my tippy toes to even reach it. While fumbling with this latch, I heard a noise. It was the sound of the back door of the house opening. The houses in this area were quite small, and often dilapidated. I would say that the back door was only around 15 feet away from the fence. It had some concrete stairs with wrought iron railings. I remember turning my head towards the noise, and having around one second to see this giant bald man in his stained white briefs charging at me from his door. He was six foot five and well over 300 pounds. He hit me like a freight train. He slammed into me so that I hit the fence hard. I think he came at me with his hands neck height, but I can't remember for sure. What I do remember vividly, though, was how he picked me up, my full body weight by my neck. I remember trying to shriek and hearing my own voice barely choking out a sound. He immediately started towards the door he came from. As he dragged me towards his house, I remember being sure that something horrific was going to happen to me and that I was going to die. I remember his hairy, sweaty body absorbing my kicks and attempts to hit him. I was screaming the whole time, but with his hands around my neck, it was an unescapable, silencing death trap. Right in front of his steps, my iPhone flew out of my hoodie pocket and hit the concrete, reminding me of its existence altogether. But now it was sitting on the ground as he hauled me up the stairs. I don't know how I mustered the strength, but that wrought iron railing gave me something to finally leverage myself against. I managed to pull away from his grasp using that fence, just long enough to grab my phone. His hand slipped off my neck but caught my hoodie's neckline, which tore down to my sternum. I was wearing another shirt underneath. This hoodie is still the grim reminder of this day. For some reason, I just can't throw it away. He immediately caught me again, but in my mind, I was for sure going to die if I didn't have my phone to somehow call for help or something. Being out of his grasp allowed for another thing. I could scream. I knew my friends were somewhere in that back alley, and I screamed bloody murder at the top of my lungs once I could. He caught me again and dragged me into his house. I vaguely remember him trying to cover my mouth or grab my throat again, but I'm not sure. Upon entering his house, I saw where he was taking me. The steps into his pitch black basement were only about four feet from his back door, and he was headed straight for it. I was certain I was going to be dragged into his rape dungeon, and no one would ever see me again. The freak had one foot down the stairs when he heard it. Before his back door fully shut, there came a sound from the outside that saved my life. It was my friend calling my name. They heard me screaming and were very close to the yard I was in, so naturally they started freaking out and calling my name. This guy heard them. He froze in his tracks, eyes fixed out the back door now. He realized I wasn't alone. All at once he let go of me and stepped out in front of the door, blocking my escape back through it. But then he started asking me all sorts of questions like he was in a frenzy. Why were you in my yard? You were stealing and vandalizing, weren't you? I was pretty messed up but started trying to explain the game we were playing, referring heavily to the fact that I was with a group of friends and just trying to cut through his yard. It was now that I got a good look at him, completely naked aside from some stained, sacky white briefs. After about 30 seconds, my friends called my phone. I've never picked up a call so fast. I immediately started yelling at her that I'm in someone's house and he's trying to kidnap me, what the house looked like, etc. 
I stayed away from him and stayed on the phone with my friend, all the while he was screaming at me that he was performing a civilian's arrest for vandalizing his property. He repeatedly threatened to call the police, to which I said please do every time. The police would get me out of his house real fast. He never did call them, but he made me write my name on a piece of paper, which I did because I just wanted him to let me go. He kept me in his house seemingly trying to figure out what to do, until around two minutes later there was violent banging on his front door. My friends had found his house, and were just going to town on his door. Then he finally let me go out the back. I probably threw up on his front lawn from nerves as soon as I was reunited with my friends. My gift to him. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you guys enjoyed the content of this video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you do decide you like my content enough to subscribe, please be sure to hit the bell button right next to the subscribe button and turn notifications to all so you can be notified of every video I post in the future. If you don't feel like doing that though, I post a video nearly every day, so you can just come back every now and then and check up on what you missed. If you guys have any criticisms on what I can do better or any feedback on the stories in the video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as I always enjoy reading all the comments and I try to give them hearts and respond when I can. If you guys would like to reach me for any reason or you would like to send in a story to be read, you can go ahead and take a look in the description below the video. You'll find the link to all of my social media, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has a theme, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. Last but not least, I also run two other channels, Mr. Blue Skies and Darkest Hour, where I do true crime videos and dark documentaries respectively. If that kind of content sounds interesting to you, why not go ahead and check it out and see if it is for you. Uh, aside from that though guys, I think that's pretty much it for now. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.